before that. So we're talking about a theme here of how do you suffer as a Christian in a suffering world perhaps, how to overcome in a world that's trying to overcome you, how to have certain hope in uncertain times. There's a lot we can relate to in this beautiful uh, book of, of that First Peter has blessed us with, and also as we will continue on into the a second letter he wrote after we complete this one. But if you want to look at chapter two of First Peter, beginning in verse 18, we're going to try to cover 18 through 25. Go back, to, first of all, let's go back to chapter 2, verse 9. He reminds them of who they are. He says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. And then verse 12, he talks about having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. He's talking here about, he reminds them again who they are. He says, hey, now this is because of who you are. You need to have a conduct worthy of your calling among the unbelieving world. Two reasons, hopefully, that they will glorify God at some point in their life. They will turn to Him and uh, that also it may make your life a little better too as they see your conduct. But in the context of how, this conduct worthy of their calling, this conduct honorable, what, what does that look like? Spell that out for us, Peter. Tell us how are we to live in this uh, society. Uh, we have a slavery going on. We've got an oppressive government. We've got homes that are, are being divided because one spouse may follow Christ and the other doesn't. How are we to act? So Peter doesn't leave them guessing. He continues to kind of flesh this out and become more practical in the latter part of chapter 2 on into chapter 3, 4, and 5. He's going to give some specifics of how they are to live in this type of world. How do they continue to be faithful? How do they continue to follow Christ? In a word, it is to submit. Submission. You submitted to Christ when you became a Christian. You submitted to the will of God for your life. You continue that life of submission in every aspect of your life. He's going to talk about first, as we're going to look at in this passage, submission of, of a slave to the master. We talked about last week, as Paul covered very well, submission to worldly governments. And then there's going to be submission spoken of in, in the home, in the marriage. So the theme here is how do you survive in this world? You submit. By submitting, you bring glory to God. By submitting, hopefully life will be easier for, for you. As they others see this change of life, uh, and they will wonder about this hope that you have and how you can continue to live and find joy in this type of world. Hopefully they will want to know more about who you follow. What's the secret here? And you'll be able to share the message of Christ. But submission, not a popular word. There's not many people who are anxious to, to submit. We all want to demand our rights. We want to stand up for ourselves. And the world teaches us that you are your authority within yourself. You don't need to bow to any authority. Everybody, need, they need to bow to you. That is total opposite, the upside down world of what Christ has called us uh, to become. But here he's going to talk about going from submission to the government to something more personal, and that is the submission of a slave to the master. Scobie says what the New Testament says about slavery has to be seen against the background of a Greco-Roman world in which the economy depended on slavery that existed on a massive scale. In today's world, we look back and knowing the history of slavery in our country, it's hard for us to, to read these passages and to understand the type of world in which they were living when it comes to, uh, when it comes to slavery. At this point in time, uh, the Christians were a very, very small minority compared again to the whole, whole world. And in, in realistic 
uh, terms, there was no possibility in a human way for them to, to rid the world of slavery, no matter how opposed to the teachings of Christ that it was. Uh, in the New Testament, the question is, how do you live with slavery, not how you eliminate it? That's, that's the question that's, that's posed here. As far as slavery, every soul is precious to God. Every soul has dignity and worth. Christ died for the slave just as much as he did for the master or for the free. Some of these who were reading Paul's letter here, uh, they, were, they were slaves. They were slaves. They were owned by someone else. And the question no doubt had come about that now that I'm following Christ, he's my master what about this relationship on earth? How should I handle the relationship with my uh, earthly master? I am but a slave. Uh, should I revolt? Should I rise up and uh, take this on? Um, let me encourage you to look at an article by Wayne Jackson on the Christian Courier. And I will not go through that in detail this morning. But it talks about how slavery was looked at in that day and time. And Wayne Jackson does a great job of going back through the Old Testament law and talk about how at that time there was a law called the Law of Hammurabi uh, who was a king and uh, the Code of Hammurabi. And it told about how terrible slaves were to be treated. But the Law of Moses elevated the treatment of slaves and brought some dignity to the slaves and it taught that how you were to treat them. Slavery was not outlawed in the law of Moses but the treatment of slaves was elevated and that was in preparation for a time in the future in which slavery was going to be done away with in a major way. There's still slavery in the world today sadly uh, as long as there's human beings that will probably be around in some form but the law of Moses said in different areas you were not to kill a slave where the law of Hammurabi said you're to kill them if they did certain things. Uh, you were to return them to their master if they run away, but the law of Moses said no, you, you, you take care of them. So we see throughout the law of Moses and then into Christianity we see an elevation of how slaves were treated. And then the book of Philemon there, uh, you read that book. That was very a novel, uh, ahead of its time approach as Paul there uh, meets Philemon in Rome who had run away from his master Onesimus. And Paul says there, you go back to him. He doesn't say you run away. You're now a brother in Christ. You go back to him. And he writes that letter to Onesimus. He said, you treat him now as, as a brother. He doesn't say there to free him, but it's kind of insinuating there that that's kind of what I believe what Paul is, is, is telling him to, to consider. But at the least, you are to treat him uh, like, like a brother, not as a slave. Uh, it said that that letter has, had as much to do going down through history and doing away with slavery, especially in the old world, as anything else. So it's hard for us to understand, well, why didn't they just go in and, and Paul and Peter and tell them just uh, change this, riot and, and revolt? Had they tried to do that as small as a minority they were, Rome would have cut them in and perhaps even kill them all, shut them down, uh, and, and uh, hindered the, the cause of the spread of, of the gospel. So there's reasons as we study history, as we look back, as, uh, to look at things in context, the way things uh, were, at, were at that time. Uh, slavery was a way of life, unfortunately. It was accepted. The morality of it, even people who believed in God, uh, just accepted it without questions. And slaves were just property. They were treated as, as, as nothing. And a death of a slave to the non-Christian, the heathen, was just like losing a piece of property. They could replace it just as easy as they could go out and buy a, a piece of equipment. There were a few highly skilled slaves who were elevated in society. There were some who even were employed by municipalities and, and cities, but those, those were very few. Some were accepted into families and treated as, as family uh, members. But the great majority of slaves who outnumbered uh, freed and free people in a lot of those areas, uh, most were doing very menial back breaking tasks. They would work in the mines, they would work in the mills, and the work was so hard it shortened their lifespan by, by many years. But slaves were just cheap. They were just a price of 
of, uh, they were just a part of the cost of doing business. They would, again, replace them just like you would an animal if something happened to them. So he's writing to them here and saying, even if you find yourself in a position of a slave, you still need to act like a Christian. You still need, even in those circumstances, to be strong and to be faithful. And he's going to tell us how, as a slave, that can be done in the latter part of this passage. Notice he says here in verse 18, Servants or slaves, be submissive to your masters with all fear. Some versions have respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. One version said to those that are unreasonable. Uh, the message says not only to good masters, but also to bad ones. Doesn't matter how horrible your master is. And it's hard for us to understand how, how much this would have challenged their faith. Here's a master who continually day after day after day after day mistreats me. Even though I'm doing good sometimes, how, how do I handle this? Peter says you can handle it, and again, he's going to tell us how in just a moment. Servants, be submissive. Be submissive to your masters. It doesn't matter what kind you have. Uh, you know, they're in a precarious state here. It could mean their death. They might could uh, save some people if they acted Christ-like, if they accepted this in the way Christ would have accepted it. It hopefully would have changed hearts. As this master who is very aggressive and very mean, as he sees this slave bear up under that time and time again, hopefully it would melt their hearts and they would want to know how they're able to do this. But he said, you are to serve your master well. You are to be submissive. In this you find favor with the Lord. Verse 19, this finds favor, or this is commendable conduct. If for the sake of conscience toward God a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. When you're, doing, when you're doing that which is good and despite being mistreated, but you endure it patiently, you endure it patiently. It's not just suffering patiently that's commendable, but he says you're suffering patiently when you did good. Here's what the message says. What counts is that you put up with it for God's sake when you're treated badly for no good reason. There's no particular virtue, verse 20, in accepting punishment that you well deserve. In other words, you do bad, you're punished for it. There's no common commendation for that. There's nothing special about that. But if you're treated badly for good behavior and you continue in spite of it to be a good servant, that's what counts with God. The New American Standard said, For what credit is there if when you sin... Verse 20 there in the New American Standard has sin. New King James uses fault. The word goes back to the root word for sin, which is the more correct translation there. For what credit or commendation is there if when you sin and you're harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what's right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor to God. When a slave is submissive, it, it, it contributes to a peaceful, orderly society. It means less, less problems because one way they're going to get through this is they're keeping their hope fixed on that day of visitation that we looked at in the previous verses. Their eyes are not on today. Their eyes are on when the Lord uh, comes back uh, in the end. And they, that will keep them going. That will give them hope and strength for the day. That's what he talks about back in Romans about being submissive to the government. It leads to a peaceable society, one in which hopefully we can, can live in peace with our government, with our, our neighbors, and it also is to God's glory. But whether or not the punishment was just or unjust, it wasn't un, unusual for slaves to be harshly treated. Notice that phrase there, when you are beaten, harshly treated. The, the word that Peter uses here is a rare, rarely used in New Testament. But it's significant that this is the same word when he talks about beaten or harshly treated. It's significant that that's the same word to, that's used of Jesus' uh, abuse and mistreatment in Matthew 26, 67 and Mark, 16, or Mark 14, 65. Uh, the slave is a vulnerable person. They are susceptible to innocent suffering. Here's a slave who's done his job. Uh, he's done it well. The master comes 
in, he's in a bad mood, he just beats the slave uh, for no reason just because he can to vent uh, his anger or his frustrations. He's innocent and yet he's suffering. Isn't it significant that Peter is going to use that same word for the innocent Christ who was beaten, though innocent, he was treated harshly, he was beaten. And Peter uses that same word here to describe this innocent slave who is suffering an injustice at the hands of his master. Uh, that, that's significant. And you know that Peter was a witness to some of that in which Jesus was abused. He was a witness so he could relate and see how the innocent Jesus was mistreated. And he has his mind, no doubt he had seen slaves mistreated the same way. And he uses that word perhaps to put their minds back as he's going to in just a moment to remember somebody else who was innocent and yet was mistreated. He says there, this is commendable. Uh, for what credit is it again when you're beaten for your sins, you take it patiently? Um, what credit is there or what favor is there? The answer is, is none at all in that situation uh, because, again, if you sin and you do wrong, then you're due the punishment. But so many of them were, were innocent. He says there, if you, uh, he uses that same word credit, what credit is, is it to you back in Luke 6, 20, 32? If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? That doesn't mean that God's keeping a debit and credit ledger here about ever recording every good deed, but he's saying anyone, slaves or otherwise, who are harshly treated because they deserve it, even if they bear that ill treatment patiently, that's hardly pleasing to God. In other words, if you're punished because you're sin, God's not pleased at any sin. There's nothing commendable or in your favor, regardless of the outcome there. So he's saying there the message here is for those specifically who are being mistreated, who are innocent. He's demanding from a slave the highest ethical and moral behavior, even to a lowly slave. Because you can see the slave again here may be asking, well, how do I act again as a Christian? How do I endure uh, this suffering? Do right. And if you're punished for doing right, that's commendable. That is in favor. God is going to favor the one who has done right, who has obeyed the Lord, who suffered for it, and had the faith to even endure it. At the end of that punishment, that slave still says, God, I believe in you. I believe you're with me. You're going to continue to be with me. That is what is commendable, verse 19. That is what is uh, favorable uh, to God. He says here again, uh, this is not just applicable either to the slave-master relationship. He's using a broad principle here of Christianity and applying it uh, to a specific example. But notice, if you will, turn to 1 Peter 3, 13 through 14. He's going to speak to the brotherhood at large here, not just to, to a specific group. In 1 Peter 3, 13 and 14, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. Do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. That's the same thing he's saying here to the slave. He's saying it to everybody. Then look at verse 17 there of chapter 3. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for what doing what is wrong. Again, the slave relationship was so prominent, he uses that as a specific illustration. It's true for the slave. It's also true for the master. It's true for every Christian wherever you find yourself. It's true in relationship to government back in chapter 2 verse 13. In the first part of chapter 3 he's going to talk about the submissive relationship in the home. But Ephesians 5.21 says, we are to submit to one another, period. We are to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So we can't just isolate this and say, well, that was just for the slave. The other passages say that this same principle applies regardless of our standing in society. But specifically at that time, that was a big issue, so he addresses it specifically uh, to those slaves. Again, they may have been wondering, should they revolt, should they rise up? The thing, even though we may not be able to completely understand it, you live within that, you try to be salt and light. 
And over time, again, Christianity was responsible for the doing away of, of slavery, the slave ships. So study the uh, stories there that came out of Great Britain and England. There's been some, uh, uh, some great documentaries and movies uh, produced on that. And look at how the basic of Christian behavior eventually changed that. It's hard for us to understand why it didn't happen quicker and why we still have slavery uh, today. But the issue is, wherever you find yourself, you live a submissive life to God, to, to Christ. If you're a slave, you submit to your master. And wh wherever you find yourself, to follow Christ is be submissive. Now why? Notice verse 21. He answers the why. For this you were called. You were called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you exa an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Now, slaves, why should you act this way? Christians, why should you be submissive in this sense because we're to follow the example of Christ. He suffered patiently while being punished without cause. He says you were called. We don't talk about that word a lot, but as Christians we are called. He says three times in this, uh, four times here he talks about calling here in chapter 2 verse 9, called from darkness to light. 3, 9, called to return blessings for cursings. 5, 10, called to eternal glory. Here we're called to a purpose. The purpose being to do what's right. And we, and the slaves say, how can I do that? How can I live right in this relationship? How can I endure suffering and punishment when I've not done anything to, to deserve it? You can do it because you're following the example of one who did it. We can get through it when we keep in our mind when that slave is being mistreated, perhaps verbally, perhaps physically, in ways we can't even imagine, that slave was to keep in mind Jesus Christ on the cross and to remember that he didn't deserve anything he went through. Matthew 10, 24, 25, he says if the men mistreated the Lord, it comes to follow that they're going to mistreat his followers also. You remember in Job 10, 4 through 6, Job complained to God and says, you're in no position to understand what's going on on earth because you've never walked upon earth. You've never been down through. How can you relate to my suffering? How can you know what, what I'm feeling? Well, when Jesus took on human flesh, it put that argument to rest. He came fully as a human, fully as God, the God-man, to walk in our steps to know exactly what it is, it is like. Jesus Christ suffered as a human, 100% human. And we have a hard time grasping how God could be incarnate. How can he be in the flesh? But he was. Uh, one thing that should cause us to want to be able to suffer victoriously is to follow his example. What better tribute to give our Savior to follow in his steps for suffering and to do it patiently and to in endure it. Uh, he says here, Jesus is an example because he suffered. But notice this, he suffered for us. Personalize your Bible, circle that, remind yourself that he suffered for me. He suffered for doing what was for doing right. He suffered patiently, but he suffered for you. Shouldn't that give us motivation to bear up under whatever innocent suffering that we're going to go through? Because he did it for us. Suffering's never pleasant. He's not saying here you're going to smile all the way through this. It's not pleasant. But since the Lord suffered, we are called to share in his lot. Paul wrote in Colossians 1.24, I rejoice. This is hard for us to grasp. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Paul, Peter understood, or Paul understood here that suffering is going to be a way of life. All who 
uh, live godly are going to suffer persecution in, in Christ. We're promised that. Paul understood that suffering is a way of life. Peter understood that. Christ left us an example, though. We're not left wondering how we can do this. And uh, I love that word there, he left us an example. This is the uh, word that goes back to a tracing. You remember in elementary school, you had those tablets as you were learning to write, and it had the dotted lines that you would trace and learn how to make a letter. That's the original language here. It goes back and it means tracing pattern. Tracing pattern. Uh, Christ is that tracing pattern. He's the one we look to. As we connect the dots in his life, we find a pattern there for our life. How can I endure this evil master day after day after day? I do the best I can. I do the best I can. And he still comes in. He mistreats me. He beats me. He abuses me. He laughs at me. Follow the dots. Trace the pattern of Jesus. And you'll find an example there. You'll find strength there that will get you through it. Peter uh, Ignatius of Antioch wrote a little later because this was going to get worse. The persecution was going to get worse. Ignatius of Antioch said, Let us be imitators of the Lord and seek who may suffer the more wrong, be the more destitute, the more despised. And we know from something Peter's going to write a little later that there was more coming. And it was going to get worse. But verse 21, you were called, Jesus left us an example. He left us in a pattern. He suffered from us, suffered for you and I. Let's follow in his steps. And then he reminded the readers then and today that even in that suffering, he was sinless. He did not commit any sin from Isaiah 53, 9, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Isaiah 53 was fundamental to the Christian understanding about the promises that God had made to Israel about this servant, this redeemer who was coming. Isaiah 53, that beautiful chapter of the suffering servant, that's the chapter from which the Ethiopian eunuch was reading there in Acts chapter 8. And you notice Peter didn't say, I'm quoting from Isaiah. Isaiah was probably so well known, and especially this passage, he didn't have to tell them. When something is quoted, hopefully we would know the word well enough to know from where it's, where it's coming from. It was so well ingrained into them that there was no need to cite the reference. But he said he committed no sin. Jesus is our pattern in, pattern in enduring in, in suffering, and he did it flawlessly. He had no fault. He did it without sin. He was sinless. And notice there was no deceit nor guile found in his mouth. Go back to chapter 2, verse 1. He says, therefore laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. See, he says there, lay aside the same thing that it said Christ was not guilty of. Lay aside that malice, that deceit, and that guile. There was no deceit found in his mouth. The deceit there and guile is the Greek word that's used, the bait to catch a fish is the background of that. Verse 23, when he reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. Notice verse Isaiah 53, 7. It's not a direct quote, but he's basically saying what Isaiah said there. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open up his mouth. The prophet affirms this innocence of Christ, but also the mildness, the meekness of, of his, his faith. Slave, don't speak out in cursing, don't respond in hatred. You leave Christ's example when you do that because notice how he responded when he was mistreated. To revile is to hurl verbal abuse. Jesus was abused in this way. We think about the physical abuse, certainly. But think about the vocal, the words. It says they spat in his face. They beat him with their fists. Others slapped him. 
saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Again, Peter, perhaps watching from a distance, seeing this take place. He'd seen the spikes driven into the hands. He had heard the reviling and the taunts directed toward our, our, our Lord. So he's not going from hearsay. He was there. No doubt those words still echoed and haunted him as he relived those moments, no, time, no doubt, time and time uh, again. And here again, he's leaving the specific admonitions from slaves to, to everyone who would read this, uh, to everyone who did not, who would read it. But he says, don't retaliate. Do not retaliate. If you're going to follow his example, you take it. You look to the one who is able to sustain you. You don't retaliate for verbal uh, uh, abuse. Uh, you may have an opportunity to, to fight back, to raise the fist in, in denial and to try to fight your way out of it. There may be an opportunity to do it, but we may cry for justice, but we don't do it. We follow the example of Christ. He didn't threaten. If you do that to me again, I'll do this. He didn't threaten. He committed himself to the one who judges righteously. Again, we say Christ was God and he couldn't feel the heartaches and sorrows we feel. We misunderstand the humanity of Christ. When he was struck on the face, it hurt just like it would us. When he was spit on, it would humiliate him just like it would us. When the spikes drove into his flesh, it was no different than if it were us. When he was ridiculed, his words, the words hurt him just like those words would hurt us. But instead of retaliation, that's what the flesh wants to do, to fight back, to stand up for our rights. The flesh cries out for vengeance. But notice, instead of retaliation, Christ showed trust. He's not asking us to abandon justice. That's what we cry for. Don't abandon justice. He's just going to say, it's not in your hands to take justice into your hands. It's not up to you to take justice upon yourself. Justice is going to happen, but it's not up to you to do that. Notice you leave justice to God. Notice what he says here. You commit yourself to the one who judges righteously. We say don't get mad, get even. Uh, King David had some chances where he could have gotten even with Saul. Saul was laying there on the ground. David could have just gotten, was close enough to thrust a spear in his, in to him to kill him, to get payback. But he said, far be it from me that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. David said, God's going to handle this. The Lord will judge righteously. And notice again that word righteously. He's going to do, a, he is perfect in his judgment. We're not. We judge too harshly. We judge too leniently. But the righteous, the judgment of God is righteous. We may want to get back at today at those who, miss, who abuse the innocent, those who turn their backs on the poor, those who take advantage of the helpless. Judgment's coming. Justice will happen. Our part here is to trust him who judges righteously. That is what we must do. Then notice, uh, let's go on to chapter 3. Verse 9 there in First Peter. How does he say to respond to this ill treatment here? Not returning evil for evil, insult for insult. Give a blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. What did Jesus say back in Luke 6? Love your enemies. Do good uh, to those who mistreat you. Easy? No. But keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the cross. Now look at the good that can result. And let's go on to verse 24. What, what did Jesus accomplish? He's going to say there is something you can accomplish by following his example. What did Jesus accomplish in suffering patiently? He bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin, live to righteousness. By his wounds we're healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you return to the shepherd and guardian uh, of your souls. What's the significance of his suffering 
even though innocent. What was the significance? The significance is that he accomplished forgiveness of sins for all those who will follow his example. In the old, he uses that term that talks about the shepherd there in verse 25 in the Old Testament. The, the sheep died for the shepherd, but in the New Testament the shepherd dies for the sheep. But he says here, this is what he accomplished by bearing up under ill treatment. You can accomplish something by bearing up under ill treatment. They may again soften the heart of that master. You may soften the heart of that neighbor who continually uh, persecutes you for your faith. As they see you, they're wanting you to strike back because they do not believe your faith is real. They do not believe if tested you will stand the test. But over time, if we'll patiently endure what's to, what is being done to us, we too can send a message and hopefully change hearts and melt hearts because they'll see there's something different. That person doesn't act like the world. That person doesn't retaliate. That person uh, doesn't, I don't have to watch my back because that person's not going to try to pay me back tomorrow for what I did for them today. You were like sheep going astray. He points them back to their uh, conversion, but you've returned to your shepherd, Jesus Christ, the overseer of your souls. You're able to do that because of what, what he says there in verse, verse 24. So the whole idea here is here in the specific sense is for slaves, you put, just put up with what, what you're going through, if you're being punished because you did something wrong, there's, there's no virtue in, in that. You did wrong. God's not going to condone any wrong at any time. But if you are punished because of what you did that was good, or you've not done anything to deserve it, you still bear up patiently. You trust the one who's going to judge that person in the end, but your prayer should not be that, God, I hope you condemn this person to hell in the end. The, your prayer should be, Lord, may they see my example and be changed by it. That should be our prayer. When these enemies, it doesn't matter who they are or where they're from even today, we should not desire that those who try to defeat Christianity will one day pay the price. Our prayer should be that our behavior today will change hearts today so that they might not know the eternity that's, that's waiting for them. It's very easy for us to become bitter and upset when we hear the stories of those who are trying to, to uh, do away with Christianity, who say very mean things, and it's just going to get worse. We want to rise up. We want to fight them physically. But let's follow the example of Christ, who though innocent, he bore it, he gave glory to God in doing so, and what did he do? He changed lives. Remember the centurion who viewed what took place on the cross and truly this man was the son of God. Because of what he did in Acts, we read of the conversion of thousands throughout that book. We read about a movement that changed the world because of what Jesus did on the cross. Who knows what life we may be able to change when we bear patiently injustices that we do not deserve. Whenever we're being called names, perhaps even at some point if we even have a physical blows struck upon us, in all of those times, bring the cross to our memory and help us to respond just, just as Christ did and let God handle the judgment. We appreciate you joining us today. We'll close our class with a prayer. We'll start our uh, live stream worship at 1030. Father, we thank you for being with us today. We thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. We thank you for all those that are joining us uh, online. Father, we thank you for this inspired word. We thank you that Peter was open to inspir inspiration to write uh, these letters. And Father, our heart breaks when we think about the conditions of many fa who found themselves in in the slave-master relationship. And Father, may the faith of those who continue to bear up under those times, those who took these words to heart, Father, we long to meet them one day in glory. Father, encourage us and give us the power to overcome uh, rejection, persecution, and help us, Father, to follow the spirit and not the flesh and help us to suppress our desires to get even. Help us to know 
what it is to live a submissive life as we follow in his steps. And Father, we pray for those that are trying to silence Christianity. We pray that they will not uh, see your wrath one day, but that they will come to know Christ as their Savior, that they will recognize you as the one true living God, and that we can be with them in glory also. Father, we pray for each one that's watching. Bless those that are hurting, those that are struggling. Lift them up today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.